Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Mike Helmick. I'm a software engineer working on serverless for Google Cloud Platform. Hi, I'm Siren Giannini, a product manager on the serverless team. Welcome to Run Containers on GCP serverless infrastructure. Well, you all know what we are talking about here. <laughs> we are talking about Cloud Run, a product that we are really excited to launch and that we announced yesterday that allows you to um, run containers on our serverless infrastructure. So first, what is serverless? This is how we define serverless at Google Cloud. Um, the three characteristics are that you do not manage the infrastructure, you have a managed security, and you only pay for usage. If you take those uh, three characteristics, you can think that doesn't only apply to compute, to compute products. And indeed, all of those products are, if we apply those characteristics, by definition, serverless. For example, if you want to store data, Firestore is an ideal serverless database. If you want to uh, you know, do cron job, well, Cloud Scheduler is an ideal way to not worry about where your crowns are running in a fully managed environment. And more precisely, um, we have three serverless products, including Cloud Run. So we are introducing Cloud Run that allows you to bring serverless to containers. So, Mike, you know, why don't you show us how easy it is to deploy a container to Cloud yeah. Run? So Let's switch to the demo. The demo. Um, we've shown this demo several times in several different sessions, so you may have seen it already. But we're just going to show how quick it is to get a pre-built container up and running in Cloud Run. So here I am in the Cloud Run UI on the Cloud Console. So we're going to hit Create Service. We've provided you an example container right here. So this is our official Hello World container. It'll pre-populate the service name based on the container name. You're free to change that if you like. It'll give you a drop-down for locations. I promise that list is going to get longer soon. Uh, and then I'm going to click Allow Unauthenticated Invocation. So by default, services in Cloud Run are private. We'll talk more about what that actually means in a minute. But I want to put this container on the internet. I'm going to go ahead and kick, hit the Create. It flips over to the service display. I see creating service. So there's a couple uh, cycles to go through here. It's going to say deploying revision, performing health check. So after we pull your container into our system, we actually start it up. It's already done. We start it up, make sure that it can start. Uh, we return an error if it can't. And then we give you a URL. So right there, I have an HTTPS URL. I can click over, and that container is serving in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> right, thank you. Let's switch back over to the slides. We'll tell you about how this works. So you might wonder, that's a great piece of technology, but why would I use Cloud Run? So let's go a little bit more into the use cases. So we can split them into two main categories. Um, always, you can run you know, HTTP request-driven workloads. So uh, some of them, uh, you will be using them for public-facing services, anything that is exposed to the internet that is serving things over the internet. Uh, for example, a website, or um, exposing an API endpoint, a backend for your mobile app, or just a simple web, web hook. For example, you're receiving a web hook from GitHub or a chatbot, for example. But you can also uh, use Cloud Run if you are breaking out the monolith of your application and are using private microservices. In that case, those services are not accessible by anybody on the internet. They are within your uh, service, uh, your, 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 your application. And um, all of those microservices will be independently scalable. So if one of them is not in use, it will just not be scaled up and it will be scaled up when needed. Um, you can do direct microservice to microservice, but also do asynchronous task execution. And here we've seen many of our alpha testers using Cloud, um, using cloud Run to do uh, data transformation, image processing, video processing, document processing, as you might have seen in some other sessions. And all of this you can do with asynchronous task execution. Well, the task is going to trigger the, um, the Cloud Run service. So as one of our uh, alpha testers says, um, what is great about Cloud Run is that because it accepts any stateless container, it allows you to use your own custom tool chains, both in terms of tool chain to manipulate containers, to build them, but also your tool chains inside the container. In that case, uh, Thomas from Airbus 
um, is using Cloud Run to run his own custom binary in a serverless way to do some image processing. But the binary is not something that you usually can uh, put in a serverless environment, except that now with Cloud Run, because you can give any stateless container, you can actually give any software to run on a serverless environment. So in that, um, in that session, we are going to deep dive into Cloud Run, uh, and in particular into the fully managed version of Cloud Run. Uh, so we are going to go over the many characteristics of the product so, you, so that you have a very good understanding of it. All right, let's go. So first, containers. Containers and serverless. You know, two things that we don't really think go well together. That reminds me peanut butter and jelly. You know, who would have imagined that mixing peanut butter and jelly would be so delicious? Well, it's the same. Like you mix the serverless um, principles with the flexibility of containers and you get something really powerful. And this is what CloudRun does. So containers, let's keep going a little bit. First, they will allow you to use any programming language you want. You are not restricted anymore about which language you can use because the cloud provider decided to only support those languages. No, this time, you use your custom languages. But, I mean, we are going to do a demo with Elixir, which is not something that you've probably seen a lot on a serverless environment. I personally run shell scripts on Cloud Run. Along with your favorite language, you can bring any uh, language package, but also any OS package. So if you have um, a package from Ubuntu you want to install, you can do so. Along with uh, these, you can bring your own custom binaries, as long as they are uh, compiled for the right um, system. But that's, that's really uh, something very powerful. You don't even need to go from source anymore. If you have a binary that does something, put it into the container. And as we all know, containers have a very large ecosystem around them. Uh, in particular, uh, there are very large ecosystem of base images, uh, some of them maintained by the official uh, language maintainers, uh, and all of this is available on Docker Hub, for example. And lastly, we have to acknowledge that containers have become an industry standard, an industry standard to package software, to distribute software, to test software, and even to deploy software. It's, it's in my opinion, much better than a zip file. So, Mike is going to talk to you about the, what your container needs to meet to run on Cloud Run. Thank you. So we have what we call the container runtime contract. The container runtime contract that we use in Cloud Run and Cloud Run on GKE is the K-native container runtime contract. So this is an open spec that we published. It defines just a few things that you need to do inside your container for us to be able to automatically scale it. So the first one is that we're focused on stateless workloads. What this means to you as an application developer is that you should not rely on any given instance of your application living from more than one request. Now, in practice on Cloud Run, we do reuse an instance of your container, and we'll send multiple requests to it, but we'll also scale them up and down as needed, right? So we're not a great use case for, say, running a memcache inside of your container. You can't guarantee it's gonna stay there, right? Um, with that, we require that you listen on a port, a specific port. We pass in an environment variable called port. Uh, in practice, it's usually 8080, but you should be prepared for that to change at any given time. That's part of the contract. Uh, and we only support HTTP 1.0 uh, currently, 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, we don't support any streaming RPCs. There's some scaling issues with uh, persistent connections uh, that we're happy to talk about uh, more depth after the talk. Uh, and then instances of your container are only running when handling a user request. This is how we're able to offer the scale that we do on Cloud Run. Uh, so between servicing user requests, we actually throttle your CPU down to near zero uh, so that you're not being billed, your container is actually not running. So with that, I'm gonna show you some code. I'm gonna show you a demo that I've built. Um, so switch over to the demo machine. I'll show that URL several times so you can, you can get the source if you like. Uh, so Steren mentioned this earlier. I've written this demo entirely in Elixir. Uh, Elixir is a dynamic language that runs on the Erlang VM. Uh, I decided I'd throw some random things at Cloud Run and see how we do. I also happen to really like functional languages. Uh, so what I've written here is a chatbot. Uh, it works with Google Hangouts chat, so if you have a G Suite domain, uh, this is something you could uh, easily do. 
has a nice chat interface, and of course, um, you know, we're using the power of Cloud Run to generate memes, because why not? Um, so create. Let's see. Right, so simple man, uh, command create. Um, it's going to go create a meme. Oh, this is actually two different microservices running out on Cloud Run. Uh, one to do the chatbot interface, one to generate the images. It responds fairly quickly. Um, but let's say here that what I want to do is I want to, this is right now a direct chat with the chat, but let's say I want to put this in rooms, because of course memes are more fun if we're sharing them with other people. Uh, so I want this to when it responds with the meme to put the, uh, put the author, uh, attribute this to the author of the, of the person who wrote it. So uh, let's switch over to Cloud Shell here. So I've got my environment all up and running. I want to show you a couple things. Um, so the first is the container contract uh, that I mentioned listening on a specific port. So it, this is pretty easy to do in most, uh, most languages and frameworks. For Elixir, this happens to be how you specify, um, specify this in the cowboy uh, config. Um, tell it to you know, pull it from the system environment variable called port. Uh, by default, this is typically hard-coded. Um, so you might find, depending on your language or your framework, it might listen on you know, 4,000 by default, 4,200, 80, 80, 8,000. There's lots of different variants in there, so make sure you get the right one. Um, the second thing is, uh, I'm going to show the Docker file. So there's, there's loads and loads of examples out on the internet for, uh, for different Docker files. What I've done here is I've actually created a six-stage Docker build, which I know sounds scary. I've done that to leverage caching in the build system. So uh, if I build this like from scratch, it takes about four minutes to build using Google Cloud Build. Um, but with the caching, if I just change one file, I'm able to recycle and get a new container within a minute, uh, and then we can get that deployed uh, very quickly on Cloud Run. So here I'm doing, again, nothing, nothing funny. I'm pulling from uh, the Elixir uh, 1.8 Alpine image, which is maintained by the Elixir community. Um, of course, Alpine then being a slimmed down image. What this gives me is it gives me the entire build chain that I need to uh, build and release an Elixir application. Uh, again, there's a couple of different steps here with different layers where I'm copying uh, specific files, looking for, hey, if the mixed build file has changed, execute this layer. If it hasn't, use the cached one, move on to the next thing compiling all the static assets, compiling my application. And then what I'm doing is, in the last stage there, I'm pulling a vanilla uh, Alpine 3.9 image, copying over just the binary, just the Elixir, or sorry, the Erlang VM, my application, and then a simple start command, right? So I actually have a very small image. This is less than 40 megabytes when pushed to GCR, uh, which means that it deploys and starts up very quickly. Okay. And then the bot code itself, uh, for those of you who are interested and wanted to dig in later, I have a uh, simple configuration here. Uh, this is a, um, a list of tuples with strings to look for and functions to dispatch to. Uh, and then in the bot here, this is the code that we're going to actually change. So in the create function, let's see, this should be where I am. Yeah, create a meme right here. So uh, in, the, in the message that I get, oh, that's create template. Let's see, create meme. In the message that I get from Hangouts chat, it has some additional information about who sent the request. So I'm just going to pull the sender, the sender name from that JSON that I get in and say created by sender name. Okay. So simple code change. Just going to, oh, I don't have mix installed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually send this over to Google Cloud Build. Gcloud build submit, give it a tag for where I want it to go. Um, you can use, uh, we support uh, tags on GCR. Uh, so if you want to tag something as V1 or switch to a V2 and maybe switch between them, we support that. At deploy time, we resolve the current value of that tag to the image digest so that if we ever had to redeploy that in the future, which is a, a feature that's coming soon, we would pull the exact same image and not, uh, not the new one from the tag. So I'm going to go ahead and hit submit on that. Um, like I said, this takes about a minute or so. So we're going to switch back to the slides, and we're going to talk rather than let you watch the build output, because it's not very exciting. Thank you, Thank you yeah. Mike. Take it, Saren. So let's recap what happened here. Um, we had source code, uh, and we packaged all of this into a container image. To do so, uh, you know, the de facto tool that everybody has heard of is Docker, the Docker command line, Docker build, bash t, Docker push. This is something to, that you can use to build container images locally on your CI system, wherever you want. As Mike has used, Google Cloud also offers build as a service if you want, 
where you only pay for when the bill is running and you know, when nothing happens, it's all managed for you. So this is cloud build. So cloud build, you can do a Docker build. This is what Mike has done. But you can do, also do more complex multi-stage builds with, with cloud build.yaml. Uh, feel free to look at the documentation. It's quite powerful actually because cloud build at the end can build containers but can do much more like deploying or executing actions. So you can use cloud build for uh, continuous delivery too. Uh, personally, uh, I recommend two other tools to build containers if you are a Java developer. I heard that Jib is very, very good. So Jib will allow you to, by importing a Maven or um, a Maven package, uh, build a container for your Java app without even having Docker installed locally. So then you use a, one command and you have a container from a Maven package that you installed into your pom.xml. Um, also, personally, I'm a fan of build packs. So build packs will help you go from a source in a given language to a container. The recipe to transform your source into a container is contained inside the build pack. And so at the end, you run a, a one command, which is a pack build, and you will, uh, you will end up with, with a container at the end without even having to worry about writing a Docker file. And uh, as I said, you know, um, you can, and I encourage you with containers to leverage this continuous integration systems and continuous delivery. That means that you build your container once, then you uh, run your test on it, then you deploy it to staging, then you deploy it to production, but it's always the same container. It's the one you've built once and you tested that, that goes into production. It's not some source that are rebuilt every time. So we are very sure that um, it's really the, the right thing that goes to prod. And so for this, uh, as I said, Cloud Build can give you a very easy tool to do so, but of course Jenkins and many other tools are helping you do that. Uh, then, uh, once you have your container image, as, as we've seen, we've seen in the, in the first demo, uh, you can deploy it to Cloud Run. So you can do it from the user interface, you can do it from the command line, gcloud beta run deploy, dash dash image. And so here, you go from your container image in Google Cloud Container Registry to Cloud Run with one command. On Cloud Run, you get a, an endpoint to invoke it, and all of this, if you remember the, the first demo, happens very fast. Just a few seconds. And I think once it's on Cloud Run, mm -hmm. yeah, once it's on Cloud Run, we give you a URL. Everything you deploy will automatically get a stable URL for that service under the run.app domain uh, secured with SSL. If that doesn't work for you, we offer free custom domain mapping. So any domain you own, you can bring your base domain or a subdomain off that base domain, map it to an individual Cloud Run service, and with that, we give you a free SSL certificate that we will auto-renew for you right before it, or about a month before it expires. We give you a little bit of leeway there. Uh, free certificates from Let's Encrypt. We also offer Firebase hosting integration. Firebase hosting allows you to add static content through a CDN, or you can do like cached API requests. So if you uh, are uh, serving, serving something where the, the answer to the API doesn't change very frequently, doing a Firebase hosting integration is potentially a good solution for you in that space. All right, so uh, the container built, I, I checked uh, while we were, while Sarah was talking. Uh, so let's switch back over to the demo. We're gonna actually uh, go ahead and deploy this change. So you can see here that it took a minute and 42 seconds, which is, which is less than half of the time for a, a complete build. So that's good. I encourage you to uh, look at the caching functionality of uh, Google Cloud Build. And it gives me the output here, so let's see. So I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna cheat. I've got the command already there. So gcloud beta run deploy. Uh, the name of the service, dash dash image, the name of the image, um, hit deploy. So I'm gonna hit that. While that's going, I'm gonna talk about a couple of other things you can do on the command line here. You can specify the memory for your container. So the default memory is 256 megabytes per instance. You can scale it up to two gigabytes per instance, uh, depending on what you need to do. Um, I've already specified 512 for this container, but I don't need to specify it every time I deploy. We remember server-side what your settings are. Same thing with environment variables. There's a couple of environment variables that this particular uh, container uses, uh, and I specified those the first time that I deployed. I don't need to specify them again, so we remember all of that server-side. Okay, so this is done. I'll show you where that's persisted real quick. So if I go back over to the Cloud Console, go into the chatbot service, I can see the list of all of the revisions that I've pushed. So we preserve the history for you there. And I can see here that I had a couple of environment variables that were set. I see the concurrency. 
Um, I have this little tab called YAML, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the API. I'll show an example in the slides later. Give you a preview now. You see at the top there, serving.knative.dev v1 alpha one. This is the Knative serving API uh, completely represented for you in a managed service. Okay, so prove that this worked. We'll go back over to the chat bot. Um, we'll create that same meme again. Right, and this time it should say who created it. There we go, okay, so we clearly got a cold start there, which happens when you deploy a new one, uh, but interactively now, much faster. Okay, so we, like I said, in summary there, we uh, built, built, we made a code change, we built an image, we deployed it to Cloud Run, that new version was up and running within 10 to 15 seconds. So I switch back to the slides, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the stuff that's going on there. At a high level, I wanna talk a little bit about the resource model uh, that we use. So I mentioned it's the Knative serving API. The top level object in there is service. So you create a service, requests come into a service. Every time you change that service, you get a new revision. So revision one, revision two, so on and so forth. Uh, only one revision is serving at a time. So if you, if you dig into the hood, under the hood of the Knative service object, there's a couple of what we call modes. There's run latest mode, which is currently what Cloud Run supports. There are also some other modes like release mode that lets you do a traffic split. Those things are coming soon. When requests come in to the current latest revision, we scale the number of container instances of that revision that are needed to handle the incoming traffic. And we scale that both up and down. Again, you only build when you're actually handling a user request. Okay. In the Knative resource model, there's a couple of other objects. There's route and configuration and also the revision resource in particular, we do expose all of those Knative uh, objects in read-only mode. So you can really dig in and see exactly what's going on with your declarative config, but we do require all changes right now to go through the service object. I showed you the preview before, but again, Knative serving API. Uh, if you go to github.com slash Knative slash serving, you can see the entire Knative serving project, all of the issues, designs that we've written, things like that. Uh, and again, under the hood, you have the YAML file uh, here. So currently, we do not support uh, kubectl. We cannot take requests through that same declarative interface. That support is also, again, coming, coming later this year. Um, but the same interface, so the same config you can take from Cloud Run, move it over to Cloud Run on GKE, get the same container up and running in that environment. Cloud Run is a regional service. Uh, each service lives in a different region. You can deploy the same service to multiple regions if you like. We do not currently offer a uh, global load balancing over those regions. Um, and right now we're live in US Central One, but we have a bunch more regions that are gonna be coming online very, very soon. Okay, it's not gonna be a long wait, I promise. So Starin's gonna talk a little bit about the invoker permissions and private services. Yeah, let's, let's spend some time on a very important concept of Cloud Run. So as Mike described, Requests are coming in and they are reaching your service. Or not, because in front of your service, there is an authentication, an authentication layer uh, that you use IAM to control who has the permission to invoke that service. So for example, it can be anybody with all users, it can be a specific user, or even a specific service account. So this, feature is key to doing public or private microservices. And let's see a few use cases, how you can use that feature. You will see it's quite powerful. So the easiest one, the most obvious one, is you have a Cloud Run service, you want to expose it to the internet, to anybody. Uh, in that case, there is no authentication required to invoke your service. How you achieve that is by giving all users the right to invoke your service. All right, this is a public service. Now, if within your architecture, you have one microservice that calls another microservice, for example, your front end now invokes your back end, well, your back end doesn't, is not exposed to the internet, right? So to be sure that only the front end calls, can, can call your back end and not anybody or not even your development team on production, well, this is how you can do it. You can give, um, the invoke permission to the front end service account. So the, and because each Cloud Run service is associated with a service account. And so then when your front end calls your back end, it has to do it by giving it, uh, by, by, by sending with the request a special header to authorize the request. 
Once you do this, only the front end can call the back end. So all of this is leveraging IAM, something you probably know uh, already if you are using Google Cloud. But that's not it. Um, if you want to do asynchronous event processing, I recommend you to use PubSub to create um, a topic and then a subscription. And then here, what you do is that you give to the subscription an identity with the service account. This is the thing you see on the, the top. And then your service, you only allow that PubSub identity to invoke your service. So once again, your service is completely private and only PubSub has, has the ability to invoke it. That's how you make asynchronous processing super secure. So in that case, I give the invoker role to uh, the PubSub service account. And by the way, when you use PubSub and CloudRun, uh, the run.app URLs are already validated for you. You don't need to do a verification step of ownership of that URL. We already know it's yours. This is PubSub. Uh, one of my other uh, tool in my tool belt is Cloud Tasks, which uh, as of uh, maybe uh, yesterday, uh, is now supporting HTTP targets. So Cloud Task is a queue, uh, queuing mechanism. You can send tasks to a queue and the queue will ensure that the tasks are processed uh, by pushing them to a Cloud Run service or to an App Engine uh, service. And in, uh, in the case of a Cloud Run service, it's the same. You give the service, um, you give the, cloud, the service account of Cloud Task the uh, permission to invoke your service. It's like PubSub. Uh, one other very useful uh, tool that you should all know about that exists in GCP is Cloud Scheduler. Cloud Scheduler is the most simplest tool you can think of. It's cron as a service. And here it's the same. You, do, you just say, I want to execute that service once a day. Cloud Scheduler will take care of that. Once a day, it will send a request to your Cloud Run service. And again, you can leverage IAM to ensure that only Cloud Scheduler is able to invoke your service and not exposing it to the internet. So same, you give the invoker role to the Cloud Scheduler service account. Let's see a demo of um, how Cloud Run can actually scale. Yeah, so to share the demo machine. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show a demo uh, of a service going from uh, zero clients to 15,000 concurrent clients over the course of 60 seconds. Um, each of these is hitting a, um, hitting a worker job that I wrote that simulates a real workload, so it burns some CPU, it sleeps to simulate network I.O., burns some CPU again. So I'm going to hit run. This particular worker is using a concurrency setting of, of 80, and, uh, 80, and when I get to the next slide, I'm going to tell you exactly what that means. Okay, so our test is up and running, off to the races. So the, the linear line that's going up is the number of clients that are hitting this service. Um, the blue line is the latency. So I would expect the latency to be a little bit variable as we scale up the number of container instances, but then it should level out um, as we get to sort of a steady state. So we're up to 6,000 clients. Um, they should be sending about two QPS each, so uh, as we cross 8,000 here, 8,000 clients here, that means they're handling about 16,000 QPS. Uh, in 30 seconds after starting at zero. So when we were at zero, the service was completely idle. Across 10,000, so we're on the way up again to 15,000 over the course of 60 seconds. We've successfully handled over half a million requests, just crossed 600,000 successful requests. There's a couple of errors in there. Um, sometimes we do see some errors when you send a whole bunch of load really quickly and have to scale up. All right, so we hit 15,000 requests, or 15,000 clients, we successfully handled over 800,000 requests. Again, this scaled up from nothing um, to a whole bunch of instances very, very quickly. Um, so let's switch back to the slides. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit, let's switch back to the slides, please. I'm talk a little bit about the concurrency settings. So we showed, um, showed some stuff with automatic scaling. Um, let's talk about concurrency. So in many serverless uh, applications today, uh, concurrency setting is one, or we call single concurrency. That means that any instance is only gonna be handling one request at a time. So AWS Lambda and Google Cloud Functions both use this single concurrency model. Um, what that means is that you may have to start up a whole bunch more instances, you might experience a lot more cold starts. In Cloud Run, we let you have multi-concurrency into a single container instance, right? Uh, so we go up to 80. Now you can specify actually any number from one to 1,000 because that's what Knative allows you to specify, but the, the limit is 80, I'll, I'll be open with you here. Uh, and what this allows you is optimize resource consu consumption. So if you have 
a, uh, a service that makes lots of network calls, there's no reason not to put multiple requests into that container at once, right? right? Avoid the cold start. Uh, unless you do optimize cost, you're only paying for the, uh, the time that your container is running, right? So if you're able to bin pack and get a lot of the shared CPU in there, you can actually end up with a lower cost overall. Uh, if you have a CPU-bound workload, if you are you know, using that CPU at 100% for the entire duration of the user request, single concurrency probably actually makes more sense for you. So you, there's, there's a lot of variability in there what you actually need, uh, and you can set this to any integer along the way. So what I've done is I, um, I run a couple of load tests uh, in, uh, with different concurrency settings here. So you can see here with 400 clients sending three QPS, or three requests per second, um, the number of instances I needed on single concurrency was just, just over 500, so it was about 540 or so. Uh, and that was able to scale up very quickly. Um, as you can see here, as the traffic drops off, those instances start to go away. So uh, again, you're only paying for when it's actually handling requests. Okay. Run that same test with a concurrency of 80, I picked out about 150 instances, right? So um, I don't know exactly what the cost was between those two tests, but I know this one was cheaper. There's less CPU time, less instances involved. So this is truly a pay for what you use experience, rapid scale up, rapid scale down. Hey, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can actually like debug and run these things too. It's important. Thanks. So out of the box, as you would expect from any serverless platform, uh, we give you visibility into your services by integrating with Stackdriver monitoring. Uh, you see all of your request logs, application logs, uh, standard outs, standard errors, dev logs, into Stackdriver logging. And when you use Stackdriver logging, as you might know, uh, your exceptions are going to be automatically captured and grouped into uh, error groups in Stackdriver error reporting. All of this is out of the box as soon as you start using Cloud Run. Uh, we are also partner, partnering with Datadog, who are uh, supporting Cloud Run uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a monitoring solution. Um, so as you've seen in Mike's demo, Cloud Run scales, scales up, and scales down. Uh, it's very important to know that each of your cloud run services will, going, will, go, will be automatically scaled um, to as many container instances as needed to handle the incoming request, right? The concurrency is on each of those container instances, but the container instance can go very high, like you've seen in Mike's demo, I think it went up to 500 when you had concurrency of one. So, but how, what does that mean for your bills? Well, uh, what you pay is not the number of scheduled instances. What you pay for is the exact CPU, memory, and number of requests that you are actually using, and uh, down to a granularity of 100 milliseconds. So what that means is that you actually, the auto-scaling is our problem. You only pay when there is requests coming to your services. So let's take an example. Uh, this is, uh, let's look at one of those instances. We can have many of them, but let's look at one. This instance will consume CPU and memory. But when are we charging you for this CPU in memory depends on if it is processing requests or not. So on, on the x-axis, it's the time, but let, let's see. So a first request arrives and, and is, is returned. Another request arrives and is returned. This can happen because as you know, Cloud Run has multiple concurrency. So on Cloud Functions, it's only one request at a time on a given instance, but on Cloud Run, two requests can come at the same time on a given instance. When that happens, what we are charging you for is the beginning of the first request up to the end of the last request. Outside of this, you are charged zero. You don't pay for, this, for anything outside the processing of the request. You only pay for CPU, memory that you use when your containers are processing requests. So from your perspective, it's literally scaled down to zero instantly. From our perspective, we might keep some things warm in case more requests arrive, but really from the perspective of your bill, you stop paying as soon as the requests are returned. And how can we achieve that <laughs> magic auto scaling? Mike is telling, going to tell there's, you a bit more. There's lots of magic. I'm gonna talk about one piece. Uh, we're talking about Gvisor. So Gvisor is the container sandbox runtime that we use on Cloud Run. It's an open source project uh, run by Google. Uh, gvisor.dev is where you can get a lot more information about that. Um, it provides a secure container isolation boundary, so we're able to start these instances extremely fast, tear them down, it's very cheap to do so, okay? 
Uh, one thing about Gvisor, not all syscalls are implemented. So you might run into some uh, unimplemented syscall warnings, which we put into your stack driver log. Uh, so if you find that your application is not working the way you expect, I would encourage you to go look there. Um, a couple things about that. Not all unimplemented syscalls are uh, a symptom that something is not working correctly. So uh, I see like set sock ops is one that is unimplemented uh, for some of the arities of that function call. Uh, and usually that's a red herring. It's not actually a problem. Uh, if you do find that unimplemented syscalls are actually causing a problem for your application, we encourage you to contact support and we can work with you to try to figure out exactly what's going on there. Yeah, uh, you, you might hit some what we call limits of the fully managed version of Cloud Run. For example, today you cannot pick more, one, more than one vCPU or more than two gigabytes of RAMs. Uh, you, you do not have access to a GPU on Cloud Run. Uh, we do not yet allow you to connect to Cloud SQL or to connect to your VPC, but that's coming very soon. <laughs> and so, and as Mike mentioned, we do not yet integrate with Google Cloud Load Balancer. But you know what? Cloud Run also, we have another version of Cloud Run, which is Cloud Run on GKE. So if you feel limited um, by those restrictions, well, you can benefit from the exact same Cloud Run developer experience, auto scaling, and automatic endpoints, uh, but within your own GKE cluster. That is called Cloud Run on GKE. And the two have been designed to expose the exact same API, which is the Knative API. It's super easy to switch between one or the other if you can change your mind later. And really, uh, it has been designed so that if you feel limited by one, you can go to the other in your own cluster this time. So uh, next, I would like to invite on stage uh, one of our alpha testers um, who have been uh, working with us for months uh, on Cloud Run, uh, Antoine and Sebastien from Veolia. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, before telling you more details about the use case we have on Cloud Run, uh, obviously, uh, it's normal for me that I, I need to introduce to you what is Veolia because it's very important for you to understand uh, how the business of Veolia is very linked to the solution like that, okay? So we work for Veolia. We are 170,000 people working in more than 50 countries around the world. We are a French company, but we are now worldwide. And we have a different of use case, a different solution. And on this particular use case, you will clearly understand what is very linked to the job we have. And what the jobs we have, three different jobs. The first one is the water. By water, I mean collecting water, providing solution for water, and recycling water. The second one is the waste, waste management. That means we recycle your waste for millions of tons every year. The last one is the energy solution. We provide an energy solution for the industry uh, for a lot of cities around the world. To be just uh, more precisely, the cats on the slide is just for the fun. We don't recycle the cats. Don't, uh, don't be afraid. But before telling you more about the use case we have, it's very important for me to introduce to you what the cloud strategy that we have. And we'll, you, you will understand that. We have five principal pillars on that. The first one is no ops. When I say no ops, I say when we have a new use case, when we are transforming an existing application, first of all, we every time think about using microservices. Microservices mean using solutions like Cloud Run, and thank you, Steren, thank you, Mike. But why? This is just because an application is not fixed at the time. Your application will evolve in the time, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month. And you need to be agile on the development. The second point, very linked to the first one, is the serverless. And we love App Engine, we love Cloud Function, and now we love Cloud Run. And that is very important, not only because of your money, because as Steven said, you only pay for what you use, but also because now you know that Veolia is an environmental company. We need to take care about the consumption of the material and the solution we use. We, we only need to use a solution when we need. And as Stiran say on the very nice billing models, you are only charged of the, the solution you need. When the, the service is not running, you don't pay for anything. So that means for Veolia, we are not using server of Google when we, no, we don't need that, okay? That's the link between the environmental impact of Veolia and the environment impact of Google. Of course, we don't want any data center because 
as you probably know, Google is doing that very well. We are not an IT company. That's not our jobs. Okay. The fourth one is secure by design. You have seen a lot of different layers of this solution that permits you to be secure when you develop an application and you push the code on Cloud Run. That's why we love that. And the last one is, that's why we are here. We love using Google Cloud and just another one, a very small company with three later that I don't have to mention. <laughs> Sebastian. Thank you, Antoine. So I'm going to present you our use case. So in our use case, Veolia is managing a water treatment plant generating a lot of data. And this data can be sensitive or subject to local regulation. So we see for them with a, a specific local algorithm where the private key is only stored on site. Then the data is ready to, to go on, cloud, on, on Google Cloud. So on Google Cloud, we have two layers of security. The first one is a native Google Cloud security layer, and the second one is the encryption on site. On cloud, we are going to make a lot of processing to make some prediction for the lo local site. During the whole process, if someone tries to read the data, even the local IT team in uh, managing the Google Cloud workload, you won't be able to read the data, nor the data, nor the result, because it's separate before the processing, during the processing, and after the processing. Then the data is sent back to the local site, and the client can answer the data with a private key and get the insight of the data. So how to do that? To do that, we need first a specific kind of algorithm called homomorphic algorithm. This kind of algorithm are made from several trees, from tens to, to hundreds, and provided by the CEI Tech Institute, which is actually the Atomic Energy Commission Research Technology Center in France. So <laughs> this kind of algorithm, first, we have to dispatch the tree calculation with a first entry point in our uh, Cloud Run instance. Because actually, the CI Tech Institute provides us only binaries. And these binaries have been linked into a Docker image. So when we publish the message for each tree, we are going to trigger in the same time all the tree calculation and the result will be stored in a Cloud Firestore database. When all the trees have been calculated, we calculate the final step, which is called the median calculation, to have the final result of the prediction. And the result will be sent back to the client. During the whole process, as I said before, the data is separate completely. So to implement the use case, Cloud Run <coughs> brings us a lot of benefits. The first one, of course, as we have a Docker image with the binaries, we could plug as a service this Docker image without any effort. The automatic scaling, because we have a lot of uh, trees to calculate, sometimes several hundreds, and they can last a few minutes. So calculating them in the same time is really something required to have a quick answer of the prediction. multi root support, because we need to dispatch the tree calculation and the media calculation is the same Docker image. So to have the multi root we have only one deployment to maintain. Fast deployment is also a, a mandatory feature because when we want to make an upgrade on the algorithm, we need to deploy quickly to answer the, the new, um, new feature we want to, to improve. And of course, the last and not the least, we save money because we only pay for what we use in, during the processing. Thank you. Uh, I bring well, back. Thanks to you for uh, helping us uh, during this uh, alpha and beta of Cloud Run. <laughs> Your feedback was really valuable during that phase, and that's why we, we are very proud to have you with us on stage today. OK, so as uh, Sébastien and Antoine mentioned, uh, Google Cloud has a few other serverless compute options. So I would like to spend uh, one minute helping you how to pick one option. If you, it's mostly, it mostly depends on the level of abstraction you, you want to position yourself at. If you want to think in terms of very simple functions that are source-based, um, that can be triggered via HTTP, but also by um, tr event triggers, by binding uh, your function to some resources, then Cloud Functions is really the perfect fit for that. It's GA, we announced many new languages for Cloud Functions uh, yesterday, uh, many new features coming. Really, uh, serverless functions, this is Cloud Functions. For use cases that are more uh, web apps or um, web backends, then 
well, you also want to think in terms of source code and not have to deal with the container, then uh, App Engine will be the best fit for, to run your serverless applications. So like Cloud Run, App Engine scales up and down on demand um, and takes your source code as input. Uh, we, we announced uh, new languages for App Engine standard environment recently. And for anything else, actually, that you want to run on a serverless uh, environment um, that, that, that is able to um, take as an input an HTTP request, Cloud Run will be the best fit for that. Um, it is supporting, it is taking your container image as an input and can uh, be triggered via HTTP, but also asynchronously using PubSub and Cloud Tasks. So Cloud Run, to recap, containers to production in seconds. The benefit of containers are multiple. You can put any language, any binary, and uh, package this into a container and deploy. It's very fast. So as you see, serverless is not only for functions anymore. It takes a container and runs it in a serverless way. And yes, Cloud Run is natively serverless. As we demonstrated to you, it scales up and down. You only pay for the exact usage of, of your Cloud Run uh, instances. And I haven't seen any server to manage, so there is no infrastructure management with Cloud Run. And lastly, we haven't put so much emphasis on this, but Cloud Run uh, gives you one experience where you want it. So what we've talked today is mostly about the fully managed version of Cloud Run, but we I also mentioned Cloud Run on GKE, which gives you the same developer experience, but this time inside your GKE cluster. And as Mike mentioned, all of this actually exposes the Knative serving API. So thanks to that API and runtime contract, you can actually run Cloud Run workloads anywhere on Kubernetes where you can install Knative. So that removes the vendor lock-in that uh, you might be worried about. So these are the three pillars of Cloud Run bringing serverless agility to containers. I would like to, if you want to learn more, um, I have a few sessions to recommend. Uh, one of them is an intro on what's new in serverless. Another one is an overview of both Cloud Run and Cloud Run on GKE. And another one is a deep dive similar to this one, except that um, a deep dive on Cloud Run on GKE. Uh, if you want to ask us questions, if you want to try uh, the demo, uh, all of this is on GitHub, and we are available on Twitter, and you can follow us on, on GitHub too. And lastly, I think Mike and I really want to thank, uh, to thank you to, uh, for attending this session. We really want to thank our alpha testers for providing such large amount of feedback and helping us shape Cloud Run for, uh, for it to be ready today for you. We really want to, sh to thank our engineering teams who have put so much effort into Cloud Run and Cloud Run on GKE. And really, now your next step is definitely get started, give it a try, cloud.google.com slash run. Thank you.